Did you get a bracelet? All right, good morning. Great to see everybody. A uh, couple of quick notes, real quick. First of all, everybody in the back, come on up here and fill up these seats. You'll be okay, trust me. Come on up, come on up, fill up these seats, because I, I need a favor from you here in a second, and, and I'm going to need it as packed as possible at the front. Now, that, get up and come on. To, yes, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, you'll live through it. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you. All right, if you haven't got a bracelet, uh, I've got bracelets for everybody today. Two sizes, all right? Uh, I'm personally not a fan of those that are real big and loopy, all right? So these are just a little bit more snug, but there's one that's more snug than the other, all right? So uh, you got two sizes of bracelets, but make sure you grab one of those uh, this morning. Thanks, thanks. Thanks for filling it in. This is great. This is great. All right, I need a favor from everybody real fast, okay? I got a friend by the name of Shane Scott. Yeah, y'all know Shane? Yeah. He, he thinks he's an amazing teacher. So here's what I need you to do for me, to just have fun. Lay out like you're just asleep. Like I am just boring you to death, which I have been the past couple of days, right? You've just been bored out of your gourd, right? So just lay out, you're just, ah! Will this ever end? So just kick back, lay on a friend, throw your feet up, whatever else. Here we go. This is what you had to endure the whole time. All right. No, lay, throw your head back, drool, whatever you got to do, whatever you normally do in class. All right. One, two, three. All right. Thank you very much. All right, uh, another item to the academy. Thank you so much. I'm now part of the flock. That rocks. All right, let's get in there. I hear uh, uh, we got one more basketball game. Is that right? Coming up this weekend? All right. Got to go support the flock. So thank you very, very much. All right, it's been a great week. And y'all have been outstanding. Uh, I appreciate so much your enthusiasm. Uh, your eagerness to get into this text, uh, for your love of the biblical text, and to look and to see how our Lord Jesus wants us to live. And so, to each and every one of you, thank you. Thank you so very much for who you are and, and, and what you do. And I also want to say, I realize that there might be some here that Christianity, you're still not sure about it, all right? I get it. I get it. There is faith involved in Christianity, but while we're searching and while you're looking, all I would ask you, just like in anything else you do, try real hard not to have too much of an opinion till you've really got into it and explored it and looked at it. Because I truly believe with all my heart that these words that we have in what I like to refer to as a heavenly library of 66 books give us insight not only into this world in which you're living, and it's the only book, it's the only book that actually has the beginning. It's the only book that attests that there is a living God who controls it all. It's the only book in which we have so many artifacts, we have so much apologetic history, and we have so, 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 so many fragments of a text. They give it validity. And it's the only book that tells us about a Savior who gave himself for us. There, there, there's a book that was written by a, fe a fellow by the name of Atticus Haygood. It's, it's kind of one of those kind of deep study theological books. I, I don't read too many of those or I'll fall asleep just like you did. But he makes the point in the book that no man can create a man bigger than himself. And what he means by that is this. Who would ever come up with a story of God coming to this earth 
and giving himself for us and dying for us. That, that's not how we think. If you think like me, I'm more of an Avenger kind of guy where, you know, you're going to come and destroy the bad guy and kill him with whatever superpower you have. Now, now that I get to dominate. But to come and to sacrifice yourself, that's, that's an unusual story. But it's the picture of our God. It's the picture of our God. But here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal. It's a story of joy. And, and, and what I want us to see as we explore this and think about it, regardless of whether we are an all-in believer or we're just kind of experimenting or we're not sure, I, I don't care wherever you are, here's what I want you to know. This is about joy. And, and, and what we find when we get into the text here, especially in this letter to the church at Philippi, is we find that the Apostle Paul wants all of us to experience great joy. And so here's what he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be, be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything and in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's a great, great thought. Uh, to be able to rejoice no matter the circumstance, to be able to rejoice no matter the situation, to have, to have a relationship that is so strong that I'm not anxious and I'm not worried. And, and here's what we know about the Apostle Paul. When he shares these words, he's in prison, right? He, he's suffering for this Lord. He, he's in prison and he's being held and charged with crimes he didn't commit by ungodly, unrighteous men. And he'll be held there for years. And if you know the Bible story, he does eventually get out of this jail. But then he ends up in another. And he'll be shipwrecked multiple times. He'll be beaten multiple times for his faith. He'll be robbed not only by those on the outside, but those inside the church. Now, that's something to keep in mind also. Uh, one of the things that sometimes discourages us with Christianity is we go, these church people aren't acting like church people. And that's true. That's true. All of us struggle. But Paul says, here's what I've found. I found that the gospel can't be contained. And even in situations that don't appear to be favorable to me, and maybe I'm dealing with some challenges, or it's painful, it's inconvenient, I have found, and Paul says, I truly believe this, that it's turned out for good. That the gospel is continuing to grow and to help others. And so here, here's our focus. We, we want to think about the joy of Christianity because throughout this letter, joy, 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 joy is mentioned all the time. I, I, I want you to experience joy. And, and what's interesting when you kind of think about this, the, the, the people in Philippi are so concerned about Paul. Now, here's what you want to think about. Think about, think about it like this. If somebody you really loved and admired or looked up to was thrown in jail unjustly, would you be concerned about them? Yeah, sure you would. You, you, you would want to reach out to them. And in fact, uh, Epaphroditus is somebody who's come from them to get to Paul, and he's sharing a gift from them to him. They're still looking to take care of him, and they're actually taking care of Paul monetarily. And so Epaphroditus is sent to them, and Paul says, I want you to go back now, and I want you to tell the brethren, I'm fine. I'm good. Don't worry about me. In fact, I'm filled with joy. I'm filled with joy. And as we look at it, here's kind of Paul's formula for joy that you see when you get into the text. He has great purpose, right? And that's what we saw from the very beginning. In, in chapter 1, uh, to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm in a win-win situation. Every single day, no matter what happens, no matter how challenging, I win. Isn't that a great thought? I always win. I always win. Because if, if I was even to die, hey, I go home to be with Jesus. But if I stay here, no matter how uncomfortable it is, I have a great purpose that I help others see Jesus. Win-win. Win-win. Every day, no matter what, I win. And here's how I'm going to do it. And here's why I do what I do. In chapter 2, this is my practice. 
Every day when I get up, I want to live like Jesus. I want to think like Jesus. I want to have the mindset like Jesus. I mean, nobody thinks like this. Nobody is selfless like this. Nobody loves like this. Nobody cares like this. Nobody gives like this. I want to, that, I want to be that. That's who I want to be. I want to think like him. And so that's my mind. But here's the deal, and this brings us to chapter 3. Well, that sounds good on paper, doesn't it? But that's not easy. That's not easy at all. It's going to require some persistence. Uh, uh, back in the 60s, uh, there was a neat <laughs> uh, psychology study done with little kids, all right? And so what a professor did out of Stanford is he got hundreds of little kids, and he would bring them into a room one at a time, and he'd put a big, fluffy marshmallow on the plate. All right, so here you are, you're four years old, there's a marshmallow. And, and he would say, okay, here's the deal. If you don't eat it, I'll bring you more marshmallows. In fact, I'll bring you a bigger marshmallow. If you don't eat this one, I'll bring you one even better. And, and he did the same thing with cookies or anything else to entice them. And then he said, all right, all right, don't eat it. It'll be better. I'll be back in a moment. And he would leave the room. And they had a camera on him. And look at this kid. Mm, mm. The marshmallow started speaking to him. Eat me. I'm loaded with sugar. Your tongue will rejoice. And so some of the kids would actually take their chair and turn it away from it. I don't want to see it. Don't want to see it. This kid, this is the one I love. He covers it up. Quit talking to me. Ah, ah. What happened? I can't take it anymore. 30% of the kids, 30% of the kids ate the marshmallow in the first minute. <laughs> it was just too much. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> Another 30% ate it within six minutes. The clock's ticking. But there was a smaller percentage. There was a smaller percentage, about 30%, who held out. And that was 10 minutes. That would be the longest they'd ever make anybody wait, 10 minutes. I mean, pretty soon that's cruelty to children, right? You know? But the 30%, here's the thing about the study that makes it so remarkable. Those kids were little kids back in the 60s when the experiment was done. They tracked them through life. And many years later, the kids that didn't eat the marshmallow, who delayed their gratification, who held out and waited for something better, those kids had better marriages, were stronger and more stable financially, had more peace and stability in their personal lives. And in essence, generally had more joy. The ones that ate it immediately, by and large, they were the ones that had great, great struggles in life and were even prone to addictions, were prone to many other of the calamities of life simply because they lacked the fortitude within inside themselves to have a persistence to wait, to wait for something better. And I'll tell you, that's a challenge. I, I think you could do this exact same study with adults, all right? It may not be a marshmallow, but we could come up with something. You know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe it's a latte. I'm going to set a little latte right here. It'll be nice and hot. From, I guarantee you 90% of Americans would not last 30 seconds if you put a hot Starbucks in front of them. Do it to your parents. Let's see how long they last, all right? If you say. But the point is this. Instant gratification rarely satisfies. Instant gratification rarely satisfies. 
That desire to eat something, that desire sometimes to do something, to be sitting at your desk and knowing you need to study, but something else comes along, and so you start doing that. Or there's a desire to, I want to go do this, I want to do this, I don't want to miss out on this. And, and we live our lives seeking to gratify ourselves and to gratify ourselves immediately, and it can come in many shapes and forms. But rarely ever does instant gratification satisfy us. There's actually a story in the Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 7. It's of a young man who's simple and foolish-minded. And he just walks out of his house one night, and the wise preacher says, you know, I saw him, I saw him, and he was walking toward this corner, and he was out late at night, and he didn't realize how naive he was, and he went to her corner. Ooh, where are we going with this? It's her corner, late at night. And she came out, and she saw him, and she grabbed him. And she said, let's, let's, let's fill ourselves with love. Don't worry, my husband's not home. We'll go to my house. And he's got a long trip. This is going to be great. And, and the whole story is that this, this young man just gets sucked into it. And what's so funny about the story, and actually it's not funny, but what's so interesting about the story is she does all the talking. He can't talk. Uh, girls, you may not know this about guys, but every now and then you, you girls are so pretty and you're so sweet. You'll go and say hi to a guy, and all he can get out is, <laughs> Hi, my name's Lucy. What's your name? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I had a buddy. We were walking through the mall. This is when I was a kid in Lubbock, Texas, and we were walking through the mall. And I remember we were in high school, so we're out there jamming. We're in the mall trying to look tough. And these cute girls were walking down the other side of the mall, and my friend had a, you know, I don't know, it was some like cup, maybe, in a, you know, like from a Chick-fil-A drink cup. And, and I saw him kind of peel. He gave me this look, like, watch this. And so he started cruising over there. And there was a trash can, and I thought, oh, he's just going to, that's, a, how convenient was that to kind of intercept the girls and drop it in the trash can? When he got to them, I don't know what happened to him, but he ran into the trash can and practically fell over. <laughs> yeah, and then they laughed, and they just kept on walking. That's what happens to guys. You girls own us, all right? But here's the sad part about the story. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who give in to that instant gratification, and it doesn't satisfy and it leads to great challenges. And so Paul wants us to experience joy. Joy's not in that. There's joy in waiting. And so go to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up because this is his next principle. And this is his advice to us. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, all right? And, and here's what he says, and I'll begin reading in verse 7, all right? And he's speaking about life. He's speaking about everything in life that everybody wants to grab, everybody wants to have immediately. Here's what he says. Whatever gain, this is Philippians 3, 7. Whatever gain I had counted a loss... For the sake of Jesus. If you were to look a little earlier in the chapter, Paul talks about, here's all my credentials. Man, I was the smartest in my class. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I was this kind of guy. I had this kind of credential. I had this kind of... Everybody loved me. Da, 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 da. Whoa, I had a great list of great stuff. But you know what? That's not what's important. So I considered it all a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Paul says, if there's anything out there that pulls me away from the Lord, if there's anything out there that tempts me with instant gratification, if there's anything out there that appeals to my pride or anything else that I know is contrary to the will of God, you know what that is to me? It's junk. It's junk. I don't want it because I know I know something better waits for me. I know there is something much better later. I'm not going to give in to a marshmallow. And so what he says, here's what I want to know. I want to gain Christ. 
that I may know the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings because like him in, I want to be like him in his death and by any means possible I can obtain to the resurrection of the dead. There is something better coming. So here's what I want you to know. This is his persistence. So this is chapter 3 and here's the third point. Persistence. Persistence. I have a purpose, chapter 1. I have a practice, the mind of Christ, but here's my persistence. Everybody has a good plan, but here's how you carry it through. And so I'm going to press. I'm going to learn to press, and I'm going to press toward a goal. Here's what I'm pressing toward. I'm pressing toward the upper call, the heavenly call in Christ. So now, now look at verses 12, 12 through 14, okay? Because here's how I'm going to do it. Not that I've already attained in other words, not that I'm already there. You may look at Paul and go, Paul, you're the man. You seem to have it all made. No, 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 no. Paul says every day I wake up with the same struggles too. Every single day I wake up wanting to grab the marshmallow. Every single day I have temptations. No, 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 no. I'm just like you. I'm human. But not that I've already attained it. Not that I'm already perfect. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brethren, I do not, do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus and let those who are mature think this way. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to press. And that begins with a word that we have in the Greek called dioko. Dioko. I, I actually have a bracelet for everybody here when you leave today. And on one side of the bracelet, it says Dioko. Uh, I don't know, you're like me. Every now and then I have a word for the year. That's my word that I'm going to really focus on. Dioko has been my word many times. To press. To strain. It requires something that has great effort. Like this guy here. Now that's straining. Anybody know who that is? Anybody know who that is? That guy's nicknamed the mountain. Yeah? Half Thor Bjornjen. Half Thor. He ain't half Thor. He's full Thor, man. That's it. All right. And this was when he set the world record of lifting a thousand plus pounds in deadlift. You know, sometimes these guys that lift real heavy, they'll be straining so hard, they'll start bleeding out of their nose. I'm like, dude, is it really that important? Put it down. <laughs> but here's Paul's point that's the kind of effort I put into my Christianity. That's the kind of effort. And, and, and when you think of the word press, that's what it means. One commentator said it like this. Dissatisfaction lies at the root of all the noblest achievements. And, you know, that's a true point. Nobody's going to get better. Nobody's going to change until they realize and they can become dissatisfied where they are right now. Nobody gets out of debt until they go, oh, I just can't take this anymore. I've got to learn how to use money wisely. Nobody gets healthy until they have a point where they go, oh, I can't take this anymore. There is a dissatisfaction there. And so to some degree, dissatisfaction is a healthy thing, right? I know I can be a little better. I know I can press a little harder. And so I'm going to press. I'm going to press. And that's what I do every day. And, and, and can y'all hear me on this, please? Everybody get your eyes on me real quick. Christianity isn't easy. No, it's really hard. There's some people out there that'll say, ah, come be a Jesus follower, and man, your life gets so... No, it actually doesn't. I'll just be honest with you. But that idea of having to press applies to anything that you want to do. School wasn't easy for me. <laughs> I, math? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. I, I, I eventually, when I got in college, I said, okay, which degree doesn't have math? And they said speech. I said, I'm in. Just, some things are hard. But even that wasn't easy. Going to work, making a living is not easy. But what makes it worth it is understanding this pressing has great purpose and meaning. 
And this straining has great value because it's going to lead to achievement. All right, anybody here grow up and you played sports and everybody was considered a winner? I, I, mean, I was in one of those leagues with my kids once, and you know it was a YMCA league. Everybody's a winner. Everybody's a winner. So you would you would have these games, and and nobody was actually keeping score. It was a soccer game, this, that, and the other. And then after the game was like, hey, everybody wins, everybody wins, everybody wins. I remember my son goes, we didn't win. I was like, oh yeah, we did. He goes, no, 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 no. We lost fourteen to two. I was counting. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually true. Suck it up, you'll survive. Because that's not how life works, right? But Paul says, this is a win-win scenario. But I'll be honest with you, it requires some straining. He says this to Timothy, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. And he talks about worldly pursuits. I mean, it's, it's hard, but you've got to run away from them. And I want you to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and steadfastness and gentleness. And I want you to fight the good fight of faith. So when you look at this in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, he begins with the first thing you've got to press. The second thing is you've got to purge, all right? You've got to purge. And here's what he says in that next verse. You forget what's behind you. All right. Where are your eyeballs, in the front or the, back, or the back of your head? The front. The only person who has eyeballs in the back of their head is your mom, right? She always sees everything, right? But here's the deal, here's the deal. God put our eyeballs in the front because he wants us doing what? Moving forward. If he had wanted us looking back, he'd have put them in the back of our head. And we'd have looked like something really weird out of some spy, sci-fi, you know, movie. But no, he put them up front. And your body, your body's designed to move How? Forward. It isn't designed to go like this. You ever seen a bunch of people try to run backwards? Oh, it's so funny. Somebody's going to fall. Somebody's going to fall. They're going to break their wrist. Going backwards, you're going to run into things. I mean, can you imagine a runner who's in a race constantly looking back? Oh, where have I been? Where have I been? Where have I been? What's going to happen? They're going to wipe out or they're going to run into somebody else. Even Jesus says, if you're truly a committed disciple, you have your hands to the plow and you're looking forward. And here's what this means. Whatever happened yesterday, whether it was really bad or really good, is yesterday. Every day is a new day, and you're looking forward. You're looking forward. Because here's what happens in life. We have bad moments. We'll say something we regret. We'll do something we're ashamed of. And Paul says, here's the joy of Christianity. You can get forgiveness. And you don't dwell on it. Oh, sure, there may be a few consequences that you kind of have to navigate and work as you move forward. But it's in the past. Anybody know anything about Paul's past? That's a rough past. Before he became a Jesus follower, he was one who threw Jesus followers in jail. It led to not only imprisonment, but it led possibly to the execution of many. He says, I was even a murderer in that regard. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going to a city and you're having to preach to people and you actually were responsible for the death? or the imprisonment of one of their family members, and you're going, hey, I want to talk to you about Jesus. They're like, really? How many times did Paul have to say, I am so sorry? Yeah, oh, he was your cousin. I am so sorry. But please, whatever I can do moving forward, it's in the past. I can't dwell on that. One of the greatest joys of Christianity is that our Lord forgives us. In fact, the Hebrew writer talking about running says, lay aside every weight and, so, and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance. And so what you see in this passage is that every element of this passage is about moving forward. It's about onward and upward. We're going to purge the past, but then we're going to make it personal. Because here's what Paul says over and over again. I press. I do not. 
I press, I do. In other words, this is personal. This is for me. All right, who raised their hand earlier this week and said they were a runner? Who was it? Did that person? <gasps> yes, you're a runner, you're a runner, runner. Okay, I had some fun with that the other day, right? Okay, you know, what, was a bear chasing you? Why would you run? All right, confession time. I used to run a lot. And I actually ran a marathon. Uh, so uh, I was actually uh, training with some friends, and it was a fundraiser for the Leukemia Society, and I was going to run a marathon, and I'd always wanted to do it. I was like, man, 26 miles? Whoa, could I actually do that? You know? And so I trained and trained and trained, and so my wife and I, we went out to uh, uh, San Diego for the race, and I got there for the race, and I was so excited, and, and I was doing great. In fact, what was really cool, when I got to the 12-mile mark, I was feeling pretty good. And, and what's interesting, when I hit the 12-mile mark, the trail on ahead kind of came together. So what it meant was when I got to about mile 12, the Kenyans who were in the lead were at mile 20. <laughs> okay, I wasn't going to win, but nonetheless. And I remember here they came and they were, the, the trails kind of went together and I thought, oh, I'm going to try to run with this guy for just a moment. Let me see if I can stay up with him. I ran with him about 30 seconds. I'm going, <laughs> I still got 12 miles ago. I'm never going to finish. You know, I was like, that was a bad, bad idea. When I got to mile 22, I was dying. I mean, I hurt so bad, I was running like Frankenstein. And I'm talking to myself out loud. <laughs> I know, it was delusional. I had gone off the deep end. I know it, and I didn't care. I was telling myself, you get tough right now. You get tough right now. Don't be a baby. you got to finish this race. and You're going to get to the end. Your wife's going to be there taking a picture, and you got to come looking like a man. You gotta, da, da. And so I'm talking. I know, I know, I know. But hey, when you're hurting that bad, you don't care. So I got to the finish line, and there were all the people cheering, and there was my wife taking a picture, and I went, I mean, I look good. Uh, I was dying on the inside, but I look good. And, and, and when we got to closer to the finish line, they were actually calling out people's names. I guess they were reading bib numbers, and so they would say somebody's name, and this and the other. And it was so cool. Right as I got to the finish line, they went, oh, and here he is, 35-year-old Phil Robertson. And I was just about ready to raise my hands up in excitement when the guy goes, and right behind him, 70-year-old Fred Smith, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm crossing the finish line like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> the Lord knows how to humble us, right? But it doesn't matter. We all run our own race. Don't compare yourself to other people. If there's some advice I can give each and every one of you, and I know it's hard, it's hard to grasp, especially when you're young and life is so new and there's so many new things out there and there's so many fancy things and, and sparkly things and, and things that interest us and we're wanting to, to make an impression on people. I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. But don't compare yourself to others. And social media, the Instagram girl, the Instagram guy, that's more of a curse than a blessing. Because we only post our great moments. And Paul says, I've made it personal. I'm not running against Peter. I'm not running against Andrew. I'm not running against John. I'm not running against anybody else who is amazing. It's me, it's my race. It's my race. And so I will press. This is the way Jesus said it. Take up your cross. And here's the deal. Your challenges are not going to necessarily be my challenges. Your issues are not necessarily going to be my issues. The person I need to focus on the most is me. Me. This is my race, and I can do it in Christ. And let me just share one more thought with you. God doesn't have grandchildren. Those of you who have grown up in Christian homes, oh, that's an awesome blessing. Your parents have taught you to love the Lord. They made you go to church and Bible class. <laughs> that's a blessing. But you got to make your faith your own. Because God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. And sometimes growing up in an environment like that isn't necessarily 
the best thing. I know that sounds odd. Because sometimes it's very easy to rely on others for our faith and for our convictions, for our knowledge, for our growth and whatever else. Make it your own. Make it your own. You can do this on your own. And then number four, here's what he says. There's a prize. And man, is it an amazing prize. It is a prize like no other. It is the upward call in Christ Jesus. But I want you to think about something. Yes, this refers to heaven. Yes, that's what we're waiting for the most. I'm not going to give in to that one little marshmallow. I'm waiting for heaven. But the prize begins now. When you put on Christ in baptism and you become his child and you begin that walk to press, you enjoy the prize now. Eternity doesn't begin when we die. Eternity begins the moment we become a child of God. That's when my eternity begins. And I begin to enjoy all the spiritual blessings that are given to the redeemed. Holiness, righteousness, sanctification, hope, love. I begin to grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Self-control is just starting. Patience. Love. You begin to enjoy it now. And there is no higher calling than this. There is no greater purpose than this. To be a representative of Jesus Christ to the world. To think like him. To have his pursuits, his character, his thoughts, his actions. To be sharing his love. You ever thought to yourself, why doesn't God just make an appearance every day? I mean, wouldn't it be great that at every afternoon about 3 o'clock, all of a sudden the skies just parted and God went, Hello, earthlings! Just reminding you, I'm here. Now, on with your business. And everybody go, ah, okay, okay. You know what would happen? After a while, it would mean nothing to us. And you know why I know that? Because that principle applies to everything else in our life. Anybody ever heard a great song? Oh, it's just awesome. Awesome. Awesome, and you play it, 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 and play it, to eventually you go, I'm kind of tired of that. Anybody ever met somebody really, really neat? Oh, you meet them, and they're right, and you hang around them a long time, then eventually, ah, I know them. Did you know that right now you have a bawling, massive ball of gas that has the capacity to heat up to billions and billions degrees And in eight minutes, its massive radiating heat will travel 93 million miles to earth and cool us and heat us and sustain our life. And every single day we go, ah, it's just the sun. Ah. I mean, without it, I'd die, but ah. So what does God use to make sure people see him? What does he use to make sure those who don't believe get to know him. He uses us. He goes, I'm going to use Phil. And, and, and so Phil's hands are going to be my hands. Phil's words will hopefully be my words. Where Phil goes would be where I would go. And it'll be a personal touch. Because what the Jesus follower wants more than anything is to grab the hand of somebody else and take them with him. That's a great prize. That's a great prize. We like to give gifts. I got a cool shirt, by the way. That's a good gift. I'm going to wear that. But to give somebody the gift of eternity forever, forever. Forever to be with Jesus. Forever to enjoy heaven. Forever to be in a world 
in which there is no temptation or sin or death or decay. Man, now that's something. And so Paul says, I'm going to wait for that. That's what I'm going to do. And, and, and here's what I want you to know. Remember what he said here. He, he said here in this, mature Christians think this way. This is what they do. You're I can eat the, I can eat the marshmallow right now, and that would be good. But then it's gone. And there's no more marshmallow. There's no more sugar. Or I could wait for something that will never, ever, ever end. You're not alone. Let me just leave you with this thought as well. I know Paul's in prison and he feels like he's alone, but he's not. He'll talk about a friend, a good friend that he calls his son in the faith, Timothy, Epaphroditus that we mentioned. He's got the brothers and sisters in Philippi with him. You can look a little later in Romans chapter 16 and he has his great board of directors that are in his life, Priscilla and Aquila, Phoebe, uh, Barnabas, John Mark. There's so many others. You're not alone. Yes, you have to carry your own cross, but you're never, ever, 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 ever alone. And don't forget that. You have your brethren always there to help you in this race. You say, you can do it. Keep running. And let me close with this. You know what's cool? I've been mentioning all week that passage, Philippians chapter 4, 4 and following. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We've been repeating that. You know what's cool about that verse? Every single point's right there. That's your formula leading to peace. And there's nothing more precious than peace. That's joyous. And so rejoice in the Lord always. There's your purpose. Let your gentleness, in other words, be meek, be kind, be giving to others. The servitude of Jesus. There's your practice. Pray to God. Forget those things that are behind. Don't be anxious for anything. There's your persistence. And it all leads to the peace. One of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples before he went to the cross. He said, I want you to know peace. And I can only imagine that these words echoed every day in their mind. No matter what was going on. No matter what circumstance. No matter what challenge. No matter how hard it was. Think, think, think. What did Jesus say? What did he say? I told you all these things. So that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Yeah. It's a tough world. But take heart. Because I've overcome the world. And so can you. You win. You overcome. And that's something to be happy about, isn't it? The joy of Christianity. There's no greater life. If you would like to talk about this more, if there's any way that I can help you more, let me know. Let me know. What's so cool about this school and where you are right now, this is what we try to share with our students every single day. This isn't just a great place to get a good college education. We educate the whole person in service to God in the world. And if I can help you in any way as you grow and walk with the Lord, let me know. Let's close it out with a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace that you offer us in Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for men like Paul who inspire us. Help us, dear Lord, to Dioko. To Dioko. To press and press and press. For we have a great purpose. And you've given us great joy. Help us. Help us never to forget that. Teach us to wait. Because we know great, great treasures and blessings and eternity awaits. And it's all because of Jesus. Pray you'll bless every young heart here. May they be inspired to walk with you throughout their life. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you all. Thank you very much.